Mohammed, uh, as the uh, mayor of Teaneck, uh, you were have the, I don't know, the um, uh, misfortune of being the early epicenter of the outbreak. But because you took rapid action, that uh, uh, designation now belongs in other places. Can you say a few words about what happened and what you did? Well, the first thing that happened, um, you know, once the outbreak, the first cases started happening in Westchester, uh, you know, there were people in Teaneck who go to that uh, synagogue, as well as people who have, uh, you know, people wanted to know what was going on, because I think it was a bar mitzvah that I think everybody went to. And um, we started having conference calls, we started getting our health department involved, and we started seeing what else was happening. Now, a lot, to our surprise, um, there were very few cases from there. Uh, what ended up happening, I think the biggest cases comes from our hospital employees as well as um, the people who are commuting on the buses. I think that that's the big, the big uh, um, reason for uh, such a big outbreak because the bus line runs from all the way from Old Japan to New York City and from New York City back. And we're what's called a bedroom community. So we saw that, you know, as you're trying to catch up and play catch up, we see, okay, we have a case. We have two cases, we have nine cases, then we have 18 cases, right? That happened last Friday to Saturday. Once it happened, 18 cases, I was like, well, if that means tomorrow I'm gonna have 36 cases, 72 cases, I'm gonna act now. And the, the attorneys, the township manager, myself, uh, the county executive of Bergen County, our congressman, uh, and uh, in conjunction with the hospital, we all started talking about this was the right thing to do, right? Which was ask for a self-quarantine shelter in place, which, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we were the first people, first per, uh, municipality in Bergen to do that. I did that Saturday at four o'clock. And then we did uh, executive orders on Sunday at one o'clock uh, with the county executive. And again, a lot of this stuff is unprecedented. Um, you know, usually it goes from the state who calls the state of an emergency, then the county, and then the towns follow suit. This way, we went the other way around to basically say everybody is moving too slow. You don't have time to to tell everybody and you know let's let's figure this out. Right now is time for action. It's here. It's moving very quickly, and we need to if we're going to do a social mitigation, then we really have to shut this down. And then well, luckily, you know, like the county executive did a, 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 a emergency, he tried to put everything down and, you know, it was messy, but, you know, by, by the end of the week, Thursday, we had, a, we had an emergency in place really where most businesses were shut down uh, other than non-essential businesses. And even today, the governor at 12 o'clock has a press conference where he's shutting down even more businesses. Great. So, so this has really um, uh, been fast moving and it's really incredible and very important that you moved so quickly. But there are still a lot of challenges uh, going forward. Um, and it would be good for you to help explain to us what's happening. Where are your hands tied? What, would you, what do you need? And, and, and who, who do we need to uh, talk to to make that happen? Yeah, I think you know, we're, we're, we have three Pearl Harbor attacks at the same time. That's how I've been describing it. The first, the first line of offense is we're asking the hospitals to fight this battle with both hands tied behind their backs. What do I mean by that? First is uh, the protective uh, gear, the PPEs as people call them, that they don't have and there's a shortage in the supply chain. The second piece is the financial aspect of what's going on with um, uh, how hospitals are gonna survive six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks out. The third piece is taking care of the health, frontline healthcare workers, because they, if you can see in Italy, you see exactly that they are the first people who are at risk the most. And if they go down, then, you know, again, it sets a whole ripple effects through the entire system. The second piece is the logistics piece, which is how are we controlling people from moving around and, and getting that literally to a crawl where people are only going out if they absolutely have to, meaning for supplies, and they only have to go out for supplies, right? Not like, oh, I think I have to go out for supplies today. I'm bored. I want to get out of the house. Let me go to the supermarket. No. You go to the supermarket once a, once a week, get everything you can, 15 minutes, get back home. Same thing going to the doctor, right? That logistics piece is very complicated because of, um, you know, constitutional issues as well as enforcement, right? What can you tell, pers what can you tell a person you can and can't do? The third piece is if we're going to ask people to stay home, then these people have to work. 
then we have to figure out financial solutions for them, right? On the top and on the bottom at the same time, meaning big companies need to be able to say, okay, your payroll, you're going to be good. Everything is still moving. You have cash, right? So they don't do layoffs. So people keep their insurance. Everything keeps moving. From the bottom, small businesses, as well as people who don't have $400 in their bank account, need to see checks right away, not loans, checks, right? Because they need to be able to stay home. So if you do those things, those two things, then everybody can stay home. You know, it's a nice little, uh, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, where we're all sheltering in place. You can, uh, hopefully you don't get sick and you, and you can stay home and you can follow directions. But if the anxiety in your employer tells you, no, you got to come to work, right? And your employer says, hey, you got a choice, come to work or we're going to have to do layoffs because that's just the world we live in, mm -hmm. then we have a problem. Yeah. Biggest challenge, Washington is not acting fast enough, right? It's not built to act fast. Government is an aircraft carrier. We are the fleet and the, you know, they, they need to turn together and that takes some time. They don't have time. Just like my governor didn't have time, my county executive didn't have time to assess the situation. They needed to act. The same thing needs to happen in DC. Uh, and, um, you know, again, they passed a bill, I think last night. I don't know what it is. Um, you know, there's, there's definite flaws uh, that we learned from the 2008 bailout, you know, like we can't give corporations, uh, you know, millions and billions of dollars, and then they, you know, give each other, give themselves bonuses, and then continue to do layoffs. I mean, they they have to protect the American taxpayer and the middle class and the people who are at the bottom, not just the top. And that's why I think that you need a top approach and a bottom approach so that this uh, this works out. And we need it yesterday. Right. Time is of essence. This is a really critical piece of, of thinking about it. We need, we need people to get together and to make sure that they can act quickly and uh, very much appreciate your comments. Do you have anything else that you would like to tell uh, people now? You know, it, it's, there's a lot of uh, second guessing going on between what's going on in January, what's going on in February, what happened in these times. I think that that's really not productive at this point, I think that um, we need to move forward to look at how we're going to get to April and April and May. And then, you know, you can go back and play the, the blame game. Right now, we need the solution game. Absolutely. And uh, if, you know, whoever is offering help, we have to take it and we have to not, um, you know, uh, we have to be, we have to work together. Yeah. And if we work together, we can, we can definitely get through this. The second piece of this is, is that, you know, I, I really hope that people understand that this pandemic is, it affects everybody, not one, any race, not any one religion. So the, we can't give in to, you know, racism, xenophobia, and these things, uh, which, you know, unfortunately I'm seeing an, an uptick in, uh, in the tri-state area. And that's really unfortunate. And I think that people need to, you know, really wake up and realize that we're all in this together. And I think that part of that is, and I, that's something that you know and we've talked about, is that it's, it's not just the government, it's not just the executives and the governors and the federal government, but um, the citizens have to participate very directly in what's going on, and I'm very glad that they're supporting you uh, in everything. Yeah, that's, that's been phenomenal. I mean, from the moment, uh, I think that we, I said that, you know, I think that there was a small minority of people who said that, oh, you're overreacting, this is the flu and this. And then those same people actually sent emails saying, you were right, thank you for your leadership. And I think the vast majority of people uh, have really appreciated that we were the first one that, to sound the alarm that we led and that the governors all followed uh, and everything kind of moved very quickly, um, you know, after uh, we had announced because TNAC was trending actually on Sunday uh, on Twitter and the internet. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and we look forward to working together and, and, and really making it possible for us to get rid of this virus. Thank you. Thank you so much for getting this out there. I appreciate it.